At the end of the day, you have to work with that person together to see what's best for you. Don't defer to your therapist that this person has like sort of Wizard of Oz or you know the Oracle of Delphi, some kind of mysterious magical powers and they know everything, right? At the end of the day, they will work with you to facilitate the right questions and the right conversations, give you support, give you guidance, empathy, validation. These are all the hallmarks to me of a good therapist. First big question. Can depression be cured? You know, I would use the word treated, and okay. um, cured implies a few things that your symptoms would never repeat, which is hard to ever promise anybody. Mm -hmm. I think that um, biologically, some people are predisposed for a variety of reasons. If they've had a history of depression, either personally or in their family, um, there might be some vulnerability in the way that their brain is working um, that puts them more at risk. They may have had early childhood vulnerabilities, trauma, abuse, that again, um, their stress thresholds, coping mechanisms, ability to be resilient might have been compromised. So for me, the word cure is a little bit dangerous because it means that it's a done deal. It also implies on some level that it's a disease in which we know the cause and therefore we know the cure. And um, the cause of depression is multifactorial, as we've spoken about in, in previous episodes. So I would say that there's a variety of things that you can do to treat depression. It's also important to know that every episode of major depressive disorder that you've had increases the risk for the next episode. That was my next question. I've been pretty open about my depression and diagnosis on, in this series. I've had three different psychiatrists during the three periods of my life where I've had my breakdown. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the correct term. And every time I've seen the psychiatrist, they've said, now that you've had this, you are 50% more likely mm -hmm. to uh, have another episode. Mm -hmm. And then I think one guy s said, after your third time, you're, it's like 85, like you're, yeah. you're going to have another episode if you ever deviate from your treatment or mm -hmm. don't stay on top mm -hmm. of it. Is yes. That, Yes. More or less accurate. Yeah, so one episode of major depressive disorder increases your likelihood of having a second one by 50%, mm -hmm. two increases it by 75%, and three increases it by 90 to 95%. But I want people to realize that that's not a death sentence, right? It's not mm -hmm. a done deal. Just because there's an elevated risk doesn't mean it's actually going to happen, and that there are a lot of things that people can do to not only minimize the risk, but they can also um, decrease the, the length of the episode, the frequency of the episode, the severity and the duration of the episode. So just because you go into an another episode doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to handle it. People always um, compare it to the first time, and often the first time they were alone. They may not have been in treatment, and they may not have found a good person, a good therapist that they really vibe and connect with. And so, yes, if there is a very strong biological predisposition, like in your family, if other people have it, sure, you could get it again. But it doesn't mean it's going to hit you the way that it hit you the first time. Med Circle and myself are not in the business of diagnosing people or advocating for a specific medication. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you this question. My, I've asked my doctors, I don't want to be on, I've told them I don't want to be on meds. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. Every time I go off of them, I spiral though. Mm -hmm. And uh, my current psychiatrist said, you're going to be on this mm -hmm. probably for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Is there hope for someone like me mm -hmm. to be med free and not spiral out of control? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Kyle, it's hard for me to speak specifically to you, but if you're asking me in general, in general, in general, because we, ha we haven't sat down. Yeah, today. we're, the, we don't have a patient <laughs> therapist relationship, relationship. Yeah. but, but I'm so glad that you're sharing this because you're asking a really sort of like, tough, very important, advanced question of like, all right, I've now had these three episodes, now what, what does this mean for me? And I would say that, look, there's, there's two parts to it. Some people say, if it ain't broke, why fix it? In the sense that if you're on the medication, right? So a lot of times people will say, doc, I'm doing great. And this is not you, this is not someone who's been dealing with it for many, many years, right? Somebody had one episode of depression and they're like, well, I'm doing fine now, right? 
that's a very different story. We can make a case for, to say a couple of things. Well, maybe you're doing better because you're on the medication. Have you thought about that, right? And why do we need to get off of it? What's the reason behind it? Person will say, well, I just I feel better, right? But we don't realize, okay, well, maybe you're feeling better because of it. The other thing is that one episode of depression untreated for a lot of people might last for like two to three months. It could be three to six months. So once you've treated that initial episode of depression, you may not need to be on it for life. But the chances when you've had multiple episodes of depression certainly increases the chances that you're going to need to be on it for a long time. However, if somebody's really able to utilize therapy. So I have a lot of patients who will say, you know what, women, I want to get pregnant. I don't really want to be on the medication. First of all, depending on the severity, there are medications that are safe to be on while you're in pregnancy. Um, I totally get that there are some people who do not want to take the risk. There are some risks that are involved um, to the fetus. They're, they're, they're small compared to the risk of untreated depression, but I respect that. So if somebody says, I want to get off of medication, I would still continue to work with them. I say, we need to just be alert. We both need to monitor it very carefully. If you find that psychotherapy can be helpful, if you find that a variety of other interventions, the diet, the Mediterranean diet that we talked about, mm -hmm. if you can be in cognitive behavioral therapy, which for me is real time, it's very proactive, it, um, it uses objective rating scales and it asks a person to track their mood, to really be involved in high quality, pleasurable, rewarding behaviors. And there's no Netflix and chill, passive, mm -hmm. I'm sitting there on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, staying home, in bed, sleeping, mm -hmm. watching TV, that's cotton candy for my brain, right? If you're gonna watch something, watch something that's really like either helping you grow or challenge you or stimulating you, or you're hanging out with other people and watching TV together, so I think that there are some people who can do well without medication under, uh, under the right circumstance, guidance, and support. Having people in your life that are meaningful, that love you, that spend time with you, you doing things out in nature. Nature is a big part of this. You have a dog. Pet therapy is a big part of sustaining someone's mental health and mood. Giving back into the community, doing work that you're doing, which is so super impressive, and really helping millions of people out there feeling engaged. So I would say, obviously, you do the best that you can with all the resources and the help and the support. But at the end of the day, don't beat yourself up if a person says, like, you need to be on medication. And, and if you realize that I'm my best optimal self with it, I would not at all think that that was a bad thing. How does somebody find the right therapist for them? Finding the right therapist is not easy. Um, I would say that there are a variety of online resources that allow you to look at your therapist profile. One of them is psychologytoday.com. People have bios on there. It shows some of their um, strengths. It also has uh, endorsements by colleagues. Um, it has a little bit of background. So I would say do the research on the therapist. Um, see if you can learn a little bit about the different types of therapies that are available. Some people um, may prefer more psychodynamic, sort of Freudian or psychoanal psychoanalytic treatment. They want to understand in terms of early childhood or family life things that didn't go wrong, what went, you know, that didn't go right, sorry, um, what went wrong, and are really interested in understanding about themselves from this point of view. So if there's an orientation that you're interested in, if there's a specialty that the person works with, um, you might be from a certain part of the world and you want someone to be sensitive to cultural issues or LGBT issues. There are a variety of things that would help you connect. Maybe you'll say, oh, that person experienced depression, that person has OCD, they would understand me better. Um, maybe I would prefer speaking to male or female. So kind of like being able to come up with a list just, you, just the way you would if you were finding a life partner. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're both very important decisions and I feel like putting something on paper can be helpful. What's interesting is we don't do that though. Mm -hmm. We go to the first doctor has an availability. Yes. Um, we don't ask them if they've even graduated. I'm not even talking about mental health. I'm yes. talking about a dentist. I mean, I, I've met doctors the day they're going to do a surgery on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big yeah. deal. And, yes. I didn't even, and then, but, I mean, before we go on a first date, I better see their Instagram. Right. <laughs> I better get their friend list on Facebook. I better yeah. get it, you know. Like, yes. it's, it's so weird how we're programmed that way. Yes that we don't research these people who have such a huge impact in our life. Totally. And you know, a lot of it is like this kind of paternalistic culture in medicine where like, just because the doctor said so. And I really believe that like, you are your own expert, right? And so yes, on some level you are deferring to somebody, but we are so quick, I think in Western culture, like with the whole self-help movement, don't get me wrong, I am a big proponent of the fact that we're talking about these issues. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you have to work with that person 
together to see what's best for you. Don't defer to your therapist that this person has like sort of Wizard of Oz or you know the Oracle of Delphi, some kind of mysterious magical powers and they know everything, right? At the end of the day, they will work with you to facilitate the right questions and the right conversations, give you support, give you guidance, empathy, validation. These are all the hallmarks to me of a good therapist, someone who listens to you, who gets you, and you know, I think people use this word very carefully in therapy, love, but I have to say, I love what I do and I love my patients. And I know that may sound weird to some people in some disciplines of like in medicine, you're not supposed, I mean, there's nothing weird going on here, right? Like I care about I, I, get, I hear that, I get that. And I want the best for them and the best outcome. So I would say, do the research, do the homework on them, even make a phone call, say, look, do you have, do you have a, can, can we talk for 10 minutes? And I usually do have a phone call with, with all patients before meeting them and I'll say like, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, what are you looking for? And just to make sure that we're the right fit. Mm -hmm. And look, it's not, a, even though I said do the homework as if you would in a life partner, they're not your life partner in the sense that you can cut the cord, you can break up with them, right? And just say, listen, I wanna meet with you, I wanna see if it's a right fit. You may do one session, you might do an extended evaluation, you might meet them for two to three sessions and see if the way that they're thinking is helpful for you. And if not, just say, you know, I really appreciate it. I was looking at it more from a consultation point of view. Um, I think I'm looking for something a little bit different than what you have to offer. And, mm -hmm. you know, and don't feel stuck. A lot of times people just go for years and they'll come to me and they'll be like, you know, my therapist knows me since I was like, you know, 10 or 12 or 17 and I feel a certain loyalty or I don't want to break their heart. And I'm like, what do you mean breaking their heart? They're there to help you. And well, be selfish. Yeah. Like, we, yeah. The selfishness is not always a bad thing. Totally. What are some fad treatments that are currently going on right now that people should be avoiding? You know, I get really concerned when there are a lot of these like over-the-counter treatments, whether it be like makeup or supplements that are like, this is supposed to get you into a great mood. Makeup? And, yeah, th there's, there's a variety of things like things that you put on your lips, put things that you put on your face that are supposed to make you happy. And I don't really get the science behind it. Um, so I would just say really be careful. Do you mean make you happy because it's a great makeup and you no. like the way you look or no. there's a chemical? There's a chemical uh -huh. uh, and somehow you're supposed to absorb and you know, that that's, there's not a lot of, of, of evidence. Even the, even the um, over the counter supplements, I would say really be careful. Um, you know, we do know like things like St. John's Ward or Ginkgo Biloba or, um, uh, rhodiola, these things are supposed to be helpful, but I would just say you want to be careful because they're not FDA approved. We don't know what concentration um, and we don't know the interaction with your medications. And that's a big mm. thing is that when you are doing some of these fad treatments, you absolutely have to let your doctor know about it because you may not think it's a big deal. You may dismiss it as being herbal, safe. They sell it at GNC, it's at the supplement store. What's the big deal? But a lot of the medication, for example, St. John's Wort, um, which works on the serotonin in the brain, can cause bleeding, right? And if you're on a blood thinner, a lot of people who have heart problems also have depression. Mm -hmm. In fact, cardiac disease is, you know, increases your risk for depression by 50%. Um, you may not realize it, but if you're on a blood thinner, it can increase your chance for bleeding. So there are some things out there, a lot of supplements out there. I would say take them with caution. We don't have a lot of science behind it. They're not regulated. They're not standardized. Uh, so be careful. The treatment with a therapist is one part of it, mm -hmm. but look, I might only see my therapist once a week. Mm -hmm. That leaves six other days. Yep. I'm not checking in with somebody. Yes. What are some of your go-to must-have coping strategies for people with depression? It's so important that you have a toolkit. I, you know, it's called the Distress Tolerance Toolkit. One of the therapies that I'm a big fan of is DBT, which is Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of, yes, your emotions are valid and the pain and suffering that you're feeling is valid, and at the same time, we want you to change your behavior. And this coping, this, this distress tolerance toolkit or this coping mechanisms um, are things that you should go to. So I would say for some people, uh, recognize what makes you feel good. For me, when I'm really stressed out, taking a warm bath is extremely helpful. I feel like, I, like there is something very powerful. People say that when you're experiencing pain during childbirth, go into a warm bath. There's something very healing and soothing about it. Um, I like to get, and this is just me, foot massages. And there's a great place in the village that you can get a $25 <laughs> one hour foot massage. You buy That's where I'm going after that. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, look, we're laughing about it, but what you need to have these, and I keep them, they're like these gift certificates that you keep in your wallet. So it's a, it's a no brainer. I opened my wallet, I had a bad day, what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna go to the store because I yes. could easily buy a bottle of, and we're talking about unhealthy copic mechanisms. Yeah. I don't want to do that, right? So if I've got something in my purse that I'm, that's going to remind me, I've got a place to go, and I always inevitably run into a friend there, 
or talk to somebody that I know that works there. Um, and I just know that I have a safe place to go. So we're talking about natural techniques, right? Going to the gym is a big one for me. I know you hate working out, like, but you like dancing, right? I do. So, so for me, working out is a big thing. Um, and, and if you can do these things in nature, even if it's a 15 minute walk in the middle of your day, if you're gonna grab a coffee, do it with somebody else. You're gonna go out and get a snack, go with someone. Talk about something not work related. Have a friend, if you can, to say, listen, you're my mental health buddy. I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna complain to you for 10 minutes, I'm gonna rant. Can you give me that? And I'll try to give you that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's so many layers of care, whether it be a friendship, whether it be exercise, whether it be stopping someplace other than going home. For a lot of people going straight home, to, like going straight home, it's very lonely. They're like, mm. what am I gonna do? And then they've got the bottle of wine and it's tempting, then they start drinking alone. Um, so if you can go to yoga class, if there's a mindfulness meditation, look, there are a lot of what they call mindfulness-based stress reduction programs all over the world now. This was something started by John Kabat-Zinn who had done research in the 70s and the 80s to find that this eight week, once a week program, so you're talking about therapy once a week, there are a lot of MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, eight weeks that you can go, it's two and a half hours, they're not that expensive. A lot of the hospitals or local like community centers hold them. Um, are there sports? Are there? Um, Wait, no, hold on. Let's go back to that. Okay. So it's eight weeks. It's eight weeks. And it's every day. It's no. It's once the the actual class is once a week. And it's two and a half hours and, of what? And of two and a half hours of a variety of things of yoga, of meditation. There's like an informational lecture series. Oh, I would love that. Now, you started the list off with bath, taking mm -hmm. a hot bath. Mm -hmm. My, I'm going to be very honest with you. My mm -hmm. reaction when you said that mm -hmm. was I rolled my eyes. I mean, mm -hmm. I take a bath all the time. I love yeah. bath. But if I'm in a depressed state oh, yeah, it's not and someone to. goes, oh, just take a hot bath, I'm like, you, that's not going to do anything for me. No, but Kyle, you'll be surprised. I'm telling you, I have patients who are suicidal, yeah. right? Okay, and this is this treatment that I'm telling you about dialectical behavior therapy is looking at people. I think that everyone could benefit from DBT and CBT, right? DBT is basically CBT plus mindfulness. There's like four key modules to it. Distress tolerance, emotional regulation, mindfulness, and interpersonal effectiveness. So these are the four main modules. And it was originally invented by somebody, Marsha Linehan, who has herself borderline personality disorder. So it was meant for the treatment of people who experience a lot of volatility in their mood, um, and a sense of chronic emptiness and boredom, um, irritability, anger, and self-harm. And in the Distress Tolerance Toolkit are these very basic, boring, kind of like you would say cheesy suggestions. And hot bath is one of them. Submerging your face in ice is one of them to sort of reset right, the sort of parasympathetic wiring. Because basically when we're stressed out, there's a lot of sympathetic discharge, fight or flight, adrenaline. And you wanna do something that will shock your system and wake it up and get out of it. Mm. So if you're depressed, you taking a hot bath, that ain't gonna solve the problem. Right. And I'm totally not trying to minimize or undermine the level of pain and severity and sadness. And I'm talking about in conjunction with your therapy, in conjunction with medication if you need it, in conjunction with exercise, in conjunction with yeah, it, it's that this. it's that I'm above my head's above water. Yes. I can finally breathe. Yes, and I'm I'm pushing away getting drowned again. Exactly. And if I can take a bath and I go, okay, good. I'm gonna have I got I got it. I'm yeah. a little more relaxed than I was an hour ago. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That I that yes. I understand. And all that does is just turning the volume down, that sense of urgency and despair. Because look, for a lot of people, when they feel depressed, they also feel anxious. And mm -hmm. that might make them spiral out of control that like I'm panicking and there's nothing because often we worry about things over which we have no control, right? And so that's, yeah. so, so the past, like there, there's a great saying by, by Dalai Lama, I believe, who says that there's, there's two days in every year in which we have no control over anything. We can't do anything. It's yesterday and tomorrow. So good. Right? And that's what depression is. It's ruminating about the past and it's worrying about the future. Yeah. So when we're feeling sad, it's very rarely about our current circumstances, right? Because for the most part, if you've got basic necessities, food and shelter, if you're experiencing, I'm not talking about medical depression, I'm talking about, okay, I'm, my head is about I water, yep. right? And, and something bad just happened to me. I just got a phone call that I didn't get that job. I'm telling you, could we expand your repertoire of coping mechanisms so that they can be more than just about my patient who wants to go home yes. and drink the bottle of wine by themselves. Yeah. So I'm gonna say, listen, I'm not gonna tell you not to. I would like to tell you not to, right? 
But the reality is, if not, none of the first nine things I gave you worked, you are going to go to your default, right? But what you're doing is you're expanding your repertoire. You're, you're humoring me by creating a list of nine other things so good. before the 10th one. So good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share one of, I know for a fact, there is an activity that I engage in every day. And when I'm finished engaging in that activity, my mind, I'm angrier, frustrated, more frustrated. Uh, I won't say I'm depressed, but I'm, it doesn't put me in a good mood. And it's going on social media. Mm -hmm. I feel myself mm -hmm. get irritated mm -hmm. reading what somebody had an opinion about mm -hmm. or seeing somebody pretending they have a perfect life mm -hmm. and I know they don't and mm -hmm. nobody does and all those things. <laughs> and I really amp up my, my list of nine. I don't mm -hmm. have a nine, but mm -hmm. absolutely taking a walk going about if I remove social media from that equation. Because mm -hmm. if you go for a 15 minute walk, but you're on Instagram yes. the whole time, yes. you haven't committed to that walk. Yes. If you go get dinner with a friend, but mm -hmm. you're checking your email, mm -hmm. you're not committed to that mm -hmm. dinner. I'm not doing this interview going, mm -hmm. yeah, that is cool. <laughs> well, you know, I'm here. Yes. Be so there with yes. whatever that yes. activity is yes. and get your phone down. Totally. Oh, totally. it's so much better. Totally. And Kyle, you know, when you, you, you hit it on the head is being there, being present, and that's what the mindfulness exercises helps you do. Um, there, one of my favorite books by John Kabat-Zinn, it's called Wherever You Go, There You Are. Mm. Right? And it's so true, right? Like, a lot of times people say, uh, if I move, you know, Dr. Rama, I live in New York, but I'm not happy here. I want to move to California. Things will be better there. And I would say, okay, I get that, right? I love California, and I'm jealous that you live there. And that was always the second place I'd want to go if I would ever move, because you have mountains, and you can ski, and you can go to the ocean, and there's a lot of beauty in nature, um, and there's also urban life, so you have a lot of options. So if you can sort of tell me reasonably, like these are the reasons why I imagine myself, I'm an outdoor person or I like to have these kind of experiences, that makes sense. But if you're moving because you think something is better somewhere else, that's a problem. I so get that. I know people who suffer from that. Mm -hmm. They have suffered because they, they don't realize what they're doing. Yeah. They think the next city, the next job, the next boyfriend, totally. that's what's going to finally I go, no, because yeah. you're still yes, here. Yes, I mean, yes, that's the, yeah. that you, and we take our baggage wherever yes. we go. So when people, you know, like when you break up with somebody, like what will change is you're still bringing the same suitcase of all the problems, right? And your suitcase, when you're in a relationship with somebody else, is mixing with their suitcase. And both of you are dumping them in the middle of the room and it's all, right? So but your, your stuff is still in there. Mm -hmm. So some, some configuration of what you're bringing to the situation. Obviously, yes, the, what the other person is bringing is the other 50% of the equation. But your stuff, the configuration has to change as well when you're mixing it with, with another person, another city, another job. I think this whole series could be summarized in saying that preventing depression or treating depression is knowing yourself, mm. which is a mm -hmm. big statement, knowing yourself. And it sounds mm -hmm. a little, you know, like, wooey, wooey, clearly he's from Los Angeles. But like, <laughs> it, it is true because when you are happy with this person, mm -hmm. when you are being honest with this person, mm -hmm. when you are not concerned about comparing this yes. person with everything else, then depression, it, it's hard for depression to creep in. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. think so? Yeah, I agree. And you know, what you were talking about, like with social media and comparing, that's a trap that we're all falling into. Oh. And this idea of unfair comparisons. And there's a line that I heard that like, we compare our insides to other people's outsides. Yes. Right? We compare our insides mm -hmm. with other. That is so good. That it's is so true. Because, you know, and I, and I tell people, I said, listen, you know, I have the benefit of getting to hear about people's insides. And I can tell you that the perfectly manicured woman that you see outside, there's a lot going on behind there. And I'm not saying this so that you feel better knowing that someone else is miserable. Yeah. I'm telling you this so that you realize that this is our shared reality yeah. of like, of, there is a lot of beauty to, in our existence and there's a law, also a lot of pain and suffering and they're both equally part of our life. But when we want to choose to only expect happy experience, another, another great equation that I love is um, happiness equals reality minus expectations. Mm. So that equation is going to be net positive, right? If either your reality is fabulous and I hope everybody's reality is or that your expectations are realistic and in line with reality. Because when there's that huge discrepancy, when your reality, you want it to be a 10, right? And your expectations are also really high. Like there's, there's going to be a disconnect and a mismatch. Working with Med Circle 
has changed the way I interact with every single person I meet. Wow. Because I used to get very angry if I thought someone treated me poorly, mm -hmm. if they gave me really bad customer service or they were short with me or they didn't say thank you when I opened the door for them. Mm -hmm. I would immediately, in my head, just have this internal rage of like, well, who do they think they are? Blah, blah. But understand, when you realize that every single person mm -hmm. is going through something, mm -hmm. you, you, I don't want to say give people a pass because yeah. you shouldn't let people treat you badly, but you at least don't let it affect you because it's yes. not about you. No, the no. waiter wasn't rude to you because you did something yes. bad. Yes. Maybe, maybe you did, but like yeah. you probably didn't. Yeah. You know, the person didn't say, they didn't say anything when you opened the door for them, not because they were trying to right. like get at you. Right. Who knows what they was going right. through their brain. Right. And that knowing that like you're probably not the first person that this has happened to, and I think that can also take some pressure off. Like the person didn't thank you. They probably don't thank a lot of people, right? Like yeah. they're being themselves. Like if yeah. you remember that sort of there was like a, a saint who kept picking up a scorpion and he kept getting bitten and he was trying to help the scorpion. The scorpion was drowning and a, a person walking by said, why do you keep taking the scorpion out of the water? He keeps biting you. And why are you trying to save him? And he's like, well, if he's not going to let go of his nature, why should I let go of mine? Mm. That's right? so good. So it's like it, they're just doing them. They're, they're being themselves. Doing them. And it literally has nothing to do with you. No. We think we're so egotistical, right. all of us. Right. Like, it's all about me. Right. It's all about me. It's not. No. Like, no one's paying attention no. to you. No. <laughs> it's your <laughs> yeah. fine. You know? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I went on a trip one time. It was a girl's trip when we were in Miami, and I had forgotten proper shoes and I'm wearing these really crappy broken sandals and my friend's like, trust me, it's dark. Nobody's looking at your, your feet. No, <laughs> literally nobody cares about nobody the cares. Like, I Yeah, we, we put that, we put it on ourselves. Uh, I want to thank you for making this series so enjoyable. Thank you know, you. waking up this morning, it was cloudy in New York, it's raining. I thought, of course, when we do our depression series, <laughs> it's raining. And, uh, but I've, I've laughed and we've laughed off camera a lot and I've smiled and I've, felt really good about the takeaways that I've gotten. And I know if I have a few takeaways that there are millions of people out there who've gotten their takeaways. That's the whole point of this. Thanks for watching. Check out the links below for more information on how to access this full series and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Did you like what you heard in this video? If you want to ask a MedCircle doctor a question directly, you can learn how by visiting the links in the description below. Thank you.